So earlier this year, on May 13th to be exact, the Australian Council cut funding from around 60 small to medium arts organisations around the country. <laughs> Theatre companies, art galleries, publications and exhibition spaces all received what was essentially a death notice. Private funding simply won't be sufficient to save them. In a few months, many of these organisations will go bankrupt and thousands of Australians will lose their jobs. These cuts aren't insignificant, nor are they anything new. They're symptomatic of a much larger problem. The Australian government is indifferent to arts. Every time a creative initiative is shut down, the government endangers people's livelihood. It takes away a vital part of our culture, and as a consequence, Australia weakens its intellectual capital. Creative businesses aren't the only ones pulling the short straw. It all starts right here in schools. The education system in Australia needs a huge overhaul. As it stands today, the Australian curriculum requires high schools to provide only one of five listed art subjects. In years nine and 10, those art subjects become electives, meaning that you can just drop them from your timetable completely. The connotations are clear. The arts don't deserve as much time. They're not a priority. So I'm here in defense of the little guy. <laughs> I believe that art should be emphasized, not eschewed in schools, and it should take up a much larger place in the curriculum for a few reasons. For one, economics. <laughs> economics is not often discussed in terms of art because it seems sacrilegious to put a price on beauty but also I think people are afraid of finding out some weird reality. You know, there's all these rumors about starving artists and things, but that's simply not true. <laughs> the good news is that art is just as much a capitalist venture as any other. The art sector employs more people than mining, farming, or <laughs> mining, farming, or construction. Creative professionals outnumber miners three people to one, and agricultural workers two people to one. It's also Australia's fastest growing industry, gaining 70,000 jobs between 2006 and 2011 during the global financial crisis, numbers that have only increased since then. Cultural tourism has experienced a 3.7% gain per annum since 2003 and it generates twice as much income as any other form of tourism in Australia. Almost half of all international tourists attend at least one cultural exhibition during their visit, and domestic travellers are overwhelmingly cultural travellers. Even, even in terms of utilitarian economics, the arts wins by a mile. People employed in the art sector report higher job satisfaction, and higher levels of self-esteem. It's frankly baffling to me that the arts isn't seen as a strong economic force, let alone its lack of financial stability. If the art sector continues to grow in accordance with current trends, Australia is looking at, an econ at, an, at a future economy built on creative minds. Creativity is the 21st century skill. In the 90s, there was a huge push for STEM subjects in schools, and for good reason. STEM used to provide lucrative career options. For example, in the US, during the technology boom, schools pushed things like software development and coding. As we move into the modern world, the modern day built on creativity, we need to rethink about our job prospects. In his book, A Whole New Mind, Daniel H. Pink, an author, and graduate of Yale Law School, details the world as it's ruled by the right-brained, or those considered artistically and emotionally intelligent. He contends that as the, as the information age fades into the conceptual age, STEM subjects will be far less important than the application of creativity in the workplace. Why? For three reasons. First, consumers already have an abundance of digital products at their doorstep. Machines will soon perform thousands of jobs that humans used to. And as a general rule, 
If businesses can outsource their workers from places like Asia, they will. The Western world now needs to promote a, something technology cannot, a proficiency in skills like empathy, design, and storytelling. That's where STEAM comes in. Devised in the late 2000s, STEAM urges creative thinking alongside traditional problem-solving methods. The idea isn't to discourage critical thinking or logic, but rather to expand upon the principles of analytics. A STEAM-based education teaches students to approach problems with both their left brain skills, like rationality, and their right brain skills, like inventiveness. Creativity and empathy will soon become the most coveted skills in the job market, because proficiency in these skills is what sets us humans apart from machines. We simply can't af cannot afford to train our children solely in areas that may become obsolete in their lifetime. So you've heard the pragmatic approach. Now let's talk about happiness. Art makes people happy. I'm not sure I need to say much more, because you already get it. If you've ever been absorbed in a piece of, in a painting or a drama performance or a piece of music, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I would like to stress, though, that emotional impact does not track second to practicality per se, especially in the minds of school children. Let's look at arts classes and student engagement. So when actively encouraged to participate in art subjects, student, student engagement across all subject areas increases tenfold. It's simple maths. A call for more variety in schools leads to more art classes, leads to more student engagement, leads to higher academic results. Seems obvious, but the Australian curriculum currently does not reflect these concepts. At this stage, I should probably clarify that when I say arts, what I really mean are the creative arts. <laughs> Things like drama, music, and visual art. Because really, the generalized term arts today can mean whatever you want it to. Universities offer economics and math under the guise of arts courses, for example. And what really needs a rethink are the creative arts. Core educational standards have been pretty static for thousands of years. Maths, logic, and language have been the foundation of education since ancient Greece, with minimal forays into artistic or physical endeavors past basic music theory. Throughout history, changing the basics hasn't been strictly necessary for the betterment of society. However, now that reform is crucial, schools seem slow or reluctant to defer from tradition. This hesitance can be, in part, put down to one weak philosophical theory. Cartesian dualism was first posited by 17th century philosopher René Descartes, that guy who's famous for saying, I think, therefore I am. So Descartes thought that the world was formed of two types of matter. There was physical matter and there was mental matter. He believed that the mind operated completely separate to the body. This theory is flawed, to say the least. Even in terms of like general neuropsychology, a basic knowledge of how the brain works is enough to quash Descartes' entire life work. <laughs> Unfortunately, dualism is a concept that has trickled down into educational circles. Schools are viewed solely as institutions to hone the mind, not so much the body. A concept that works fine for just about every other subject except sport and the creative arts. The, performing art, the performance arts in particular center strictly, solely around psychomotor skills. Kinesthetics, as they're called formally, are, involve coordination, spatial awareness, and coordination and spatial awareness. In education, actions speak just as loud as words. The combination of mind and body, of mental capacity and muscle memory, memory is, a, is a vastly superior method of retaining information than just reading over words over and over again, barely even using your mind. 
Kinesthetic aptitude is the basis of, of coordination as well as skills like typing. So there is an argument there for practicality. Kinesthetics, however, is also closely related to creativity, the most undervalued skill in Australia's education system. It's unsurprising, given its penchant for routine examinations of core skills, that, um, that the education system doesn't welcome the subjectivity inherent in evaluating creative work. Every artist sees their work and its message in their own little vacuum. There's no one right answer to the, to the question, what does this piece of art mean? Except maybe the one that the artist comes up with themselves. Even so, it's tricky to invalidate like the differing opinions of the audience. So how do we encourage innovation, invention, and contribution in the arts? How do we incorporate that subjectivity into the curriculum? Look at it this way. The creative arts are just another language. They portray a belief or an experience, not through words, but through things even more intuitive to us, like color and movement. There are no language barriers, no social barriers, no cultural barriers between art and its audience. By broadening, by broadening our exposure to artistic practice, the, we simultaneously broaden our emotional understanding and cultural understanding. Innovation or imagination is just another skill. It's like any other. It is constructed and strengthened by the theories and hypotheses of others. Through observation and discussion, creativity could be practiced like any other skill in the classroom. If only it could be considered alongside literacy and numeracy in its significance, schools might finally be able to update their curriculum to reflect the demands of the 21st century. So what now? I've just spent 10 minutes detailing a problem and you're wondering, or maybe not, what's the solution? I don't have a solution. <laughs> I don't have a definitive solution, that is. What I do have are high hopes for the future of arts education in Australia. Because in about two years, the Queensland curriculum will have undergone a complete refor reformation. In two years, after every tiny facet of the Queensland education system is audited and redesigned, I hope that the arts gets the attention they deserve. We need to see some drastic changes, and I hope after my speech today that you realize why. If not, I leave you with a small phrase. Ars gratia artis, translated to art for art's sake. If you think you've heard it before or seen it before, it's actually the slogan of MGM, or Metro Goldwyn Mayer, which is a film company, the one with the lion at the start of old movies that roars. <laughs> In the end, art is about emotion. It's about a feeling. If art can evoke an emotion or feeling from you, then it has merit. Anything that can change your perception or make you question the world is worth studying. It's not rocket science. It's simple as that. Thank you.